This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for this program is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. R. Scott Williams has written a book about a man that many have called the real Indiana Jones. The man's name was Richard Halliburton, and Memphis has claimed him as being one of its most interesting characters. The new book by Williams is entitled The Forgotten Adventures of Richard Halliburton, A High-Flying Life from Tennessee to Timbuktu, and it's our pleasure to have you on the program today. It's fantastic to be here. <laughs> well, now, what about those analogies to uh, Indiana Jones? Uh, As I researched, you know, I saw them picked up. I, I couldn't, I could never determine the exact, you know, place that it came from. Uh -huh. But certainly, it makes logical sense. You know, when you look at his life and the things he did, and and his personal brand, it it, it lines up very nicely with Indiana Jones. You know, we were talking before. And at the time that he was growing up, uh, the culture was closer to the 19th century than it was to the 20th century. Uh, people would take on the family business. They would live in the same time, uh, live in the same town all of their lives. And I guess in this case, it would have been Brownsville, Tennessee, mm -hmm. and uh, and died there. But this was not for Halliburton, even in his younger days. He, he tried to run away at one point. Yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah, tell me about that. Yeah, sure. Well, um, you know, Halliburton's family moved from Brownsville, Tennessee, where he was born, to Memphis. His dad was in the timber and real estate business. Um, his mother was a was a pianist and an educator, and she taught music. Mm -hmm. um, and so the Halliburtons, you know, were here in Memphis, but but they did send their son away to boarding school. Um, and so, you know, he did get a taste of, you know, a different lifestyle mm -hmm. than what was here. Um, at one point, um, he wanted to experience Europe, but he wanted to do it as a vagabond. And so... Um, he worked out a deal in his head where he, the plan was he would get his mother to take him to Memphis Union Station, drop him off, and he was supposedly going to Brownsville, Tennessee to visit um, some of his buddies who lived there. Mm -hmm. And so he was going to drop a letter in the mail so that it would arrive to his dad's office on Monday morning. By that time, he was, you know, he was away. Unfortunately, the buddy who, in Brownsville didn't know of the plan and came to Memphis to visit him and knocked on the Halliburton's door <laughs> and said, can Richard come out and play? You know, so yeah. they, you know, they panicked and, and uh, freaked out. And the, and the father, you know, Wesley Halliburton, you know, tried to keep his wife calm. There's actually three different stories from, from each of their, um, from each of their um, opinions of what actually happened. Each of their memory was a little different. Um, Richards, of course, was very uh, exciting and dramatic. You know, in later years, he said that his parents put ads in the paper and there was, you know, there was a search on. Uh -huh. You know, his mother remembered going door to door, where his father, you know, remembered being calm and being, and his father actually called around to Memphis hotel rooms, not called around, went around to Memphis hotel uh -huh. rooms to see if he could um, find his son, maybe checked into to a hotel room, you know, with possibly a young lady. So um, it was, you know, everybody had a different memory. In fact, Richard did um, go to New Orleans on the train. He um, worked his way over to Europe and then vagabonded around. Uh -huh. His father sent him a letter and, you know, talked about the tenor of his ways and wished that he would settle down. And, you know, he basically told his dad he was never going to settle down. Uh, and he scared his parents half to death on that one, I'm sure. He, yeah, he, 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 never, <laughs> he never did settle down, although they kept trying. Yeah. Well, now he achieved a level of fame. Now, that... I knew he was famous. Mm -hmm. I, I I knew that. But when I read how famous he was, he uh, ended up achieving a level of fame that was close to Charlie Chaplin and Rudolph Valentino. Oh yeah, absolutely. He was. Um, he his um, articles eventually were syndicated, so they were in most of the newspapers in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, he was very well known as sort of the boy adventurer. Um, he would travel. He would write books, and he would write um, articles, and he would lecture. And then the money that he made would fund his next adventure. And so he would, you know, fly, fly airplanes across the Sahara Desert. Mm -hmm. He would jump off of, you know, jump off a cliff into a Mayan well of de death. 
He would uh, swim the Panama Canal, and then he would write books about and, and articles about it, and, and that would then further fuel his personal brand that he would create. Hmm, my goodness. Well, it's funny, uh, you uh, listed some of the, the, uh, the things that he accomplished. Uh, if you gave me the Reader's Digest version, now uh, you mentioned a few of them, mm -hmm. uh, sw uh, swimming uh, the, uh, uh, the Panama, Panama Canal, Canal sure. uh, and, uh, and, and the Mayan Well of, well of Death. My, a Mayan Well of Death, yeah, where uh -huh. they had thrown, they would throw, you know, sacrifice virgins into this Well of Death, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And so he um, thought, you know what, I'm going to jump in that. Now, according to everything I've read from him and everything I read of, from people, you know, he, he, he dove in without necessarily checking to make sure that he was going to make it. You know, he didn't, he didn't investigate it as much as, as one would think one would. Uh -huh. But um, what's interesting is he did it. Everybody was shocked. They couldn't believe he did it. He survived. He had been recently accused of lying about uh, swimming in the Taj Mahal pool, uh -huh. which he did, and, um, but, but people accused him of lying. So he went back to the town he was in, and he got a photographer and a news crew, and he went back to the, to the well again and did it again, and this time got it, on, got it on film so that he could prove that without a shadow of a doubt he did it. Oh, my gosh. Well, you, you know, the, uh, one of the things about great personages, uh, when, you, when you read biographies, there always seems to be some sort of a, of a childhood uh, mm -hmm. illness in there mm -hmm. that seems to just uh, make them uh, uh, have a spine of steel after they get through. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about uh, Halliburton's experience. Sure. Um, you know, he, he had, um, what, you know, back then, of course, health care was a lot different. Mm -hmm. um, sanitation was a lot different. Yeah. And so there were a lot of people who got sick and died of a lot of different um, illnesses. Well, his parents, of course, um, his mother and father were both, had both been orphaned very young. And so they um, certainly wanted to take care of their, of their two boys. They had two boys, Richard and, and Wesley Jr. Um, and Richard had a uh, heartbeat um, problem and, um, you know, he was a little weaker than his brother who was a, an athlete and, mm -hmm. you know, Richard was the one who was a little paler and preferred to read and, and mm -hmm. stay in the shade, whereas his brother was the athlete. So they, um, they sent him to different hospitals um, and uh, Richard ended up going to Battle Creek, Michigan, you know, to the famous um, sanitarium there um, yeah. where he was treated. Um, Ironically, though, it ended up being his 14-year-old brother um, who, who died of, of, of rheumatic fever, mm -hmm. damaged his heart, and he passed away here in Memphis um, on uh, New Year's Day. And so, you know, I think that was certainly uh, something that would motivate anyone. And so I think Richard always felt like after that he really needed to, um, you know, he needed to live for both he and his brother. And that also made him really value today and value you know, the experiences and the things that you can do today. So mm -hmm. he, did, he didn't put off his life. He did everything, you know, with, with, with full force and with gusto. Yeah, and of course you're talking about a guy who's constantly trying to top himself. Exactly. He had to because, you know, that's what would generate the publicity, you know, the media attention. He was, he was uh, for a while, he was a media darling, and he was, he was really beloved by people who were like librarians and people who wanted to get kids to read because everybody loved to read his books. His books were on the bestseller list, mm -hmm. um, and they taught kids about, you know, geography and travel, and, you know, he, he was very, very much, you know, a person that the people loved. The critics, however, you know, thought his books were, you know, somewhat made up, you know, the, uh -huh. the Esquire magazines and the Vanity Fairs and, you know, they were very judgmental and critical. Right. You know, I saw him. one where uh, one critic said, uh, uh, t uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, typical rich kid, got a lot of time on his hands. He does all these, he does all these exploits, uh, you know, just waiting around for the next party that he's going to go to, you know, yeah, stuff exactly, like that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. They, did, they didn't, and also, you know, Richard admitted that he would throw a coat of red paint onto a story to make it a little more interesting. So he would elaborate <laughs> and exaggerate. Yeah. So he wasn't exactly a journalist who was covering the truth. Right. He was entertaining, and he was using travel and adventure as a way to entertain. And he, he, he branded himself early on as the boy adventurer, you know, mm -hmm. as the young guy who, you know, was all about youth and romance and travel. But then by the time he started getting older and he wanted to, um, you know, start to be taken more seriously a, as, a, as a writer and, and as a journalist, you know, he already had, had branded himself in, in a different way. So he was having, he struggled all the way up until his death to change that. Of all of his exploits, uh, what, what was your favorite? 
Um, you know, my favorite, um, he, he began to um, notice all the attention and all the media that Charles Lindbergh was getting. And so he thought to himself, you know, what I need is an airplane. And so he, you know, he, he looked around for, for a pilot mm -hmm. who could, you know, because he, he couldn't, you know, he wasn't a pilot himself. Right. So he, he hired one pilot who, who, as it turned out, had never flown a plane before. So he, he uh, <laughs> but in true, the, the way Richard Halliburton, he, he really was a good person. And so he um, got flying lessons for that pilot, hoping he could, that fake pilot, hoping he could become a real pilot, but he didn't. So um, flying um, he finally found Moy Stevens, who was an amazing pilot, and just reading about him, there's books about Moy Stevens, you know, who was, you know, a, a really young uh, guy who was in the movies in the 20s and, and flew a lot of, of the planes and the movies that you see. Mm -hmm. So together, you know, they, they took off in an airplane called the Flying Carpet, and their only rule was that there were no rules. They could go anywhere they wanted to go, they could do anywhere, anything they wanted to do, and they would stay there as long as, as they wanted to. And so the adventures that they went on are just, are just really, really amazing. And, that, and that's my favorite, my favorite part of his, his adventures. Mm -hmm. Well, we talked about him trying to top himself mm -hmm. and things like that. And, uh, uh, but early on, it was hard for, for Halliburton to get to, to find his connection to the audience. And right. then he ran into a guy uh, that you talk about in a book called William B. Freakins. Mm -hmm. uh, what was so important about Freakins mm -hmm. in the Halliburton's life? Well, um, he, he was um, 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 a uh, manager of uh -huh. people who did public speaking. Right. You know, and back, back in the day, um, we, they didn't have movie theaters. And so, mm -hmm. and that, that was something that I didn't really realize is just how much people would go out and sit in audiences and listen to people speak about an unbelievable number of topics. I, I've seen a, like a catalog that the person who, you know, had a, an, a theater or, or, or a space and that they would use to book right. you know, different, right. different um, topics. And so mm -hmm. um, he, heard, he heard Richard um, speaking and said, you know what, I think there's an opportunity there. This guy's young, he's energetic, I'm going to put him um, on the stage um, and see what happens. And at first things didn't go so well, but Richard finally, you know, kept trying and, and, and they, had see, they saw a spark in there. Um, and then finally he just, his, his natural uh, charisma came out and he just began to thrill audiences everywhere he went. You know, it's very funny to me, you know, that was a, an industry that people were older when they would do it. And so because he was young, right. you know, he really stood out. And, and, uh, and uh, that was something that um, was funny to read how people were sort of rude to him at first because they thought this, this kid can't possibly entertain this audience. And then he would get up there and just people would give him standing ovations. You know, another extraordinary thing, and you touched on this before, were, were, was the fact that he did have his critics, mm -hmm. and uh, it just didn't seem to bother him at all. I mean, you know, I mean, from what I can see, I mean, right. it seemed as if he just said whatever, and he just went to the next uh, next adventure. Yeah, he 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 um, would keep going. Mm -hmm. um, I do think there are indications that some things did sort of bother him a little bit, and he mm -hmm. would try to um, prove people wrong. You know, he didn't fight so much. He was you know, very sensitive you know. in his letters. And yeah, stuff he was like very that. sensitive, yeah. and mm -hmm. and he didn't he didn't say how dare you say that about me? I'm going to make you take it back. He just worked all that much harder to prove you wrong. Yeah. So he was really trying, um, you know, really trying to write legitimate stories. And you can see, you know, I mean, I, I had never read a book by Richard Halliburton when I started, but now I've read all the books by Richard Halliburton. So um, and and it's funny, you know, his, his books are out of print, but mm -hmm. you can get them online for, you know, $3 or whatever. So, you know, I got, I was able to get, and, and w I got one Richard Halliburton book that was like $15 and it was autographed by Richard Halliburton. So, yeah, so, wow. yeah, so, so his books are, are out there and available. And it was really fascinating to see the transition of his writing through the years. I mean, mm -hmm. the things that he wrote about, you know, towards the end when he was a syndicated, very popular, very successful um um, journalist by that time who could sell a lot of papers. Um, mm -hmm. He would was given a contract with Ladies Home Journal um, and and a, a newspaper syndicate, and and they said you can go anywhere, you can write about anything, just give us forty articles, you mm -hmm. know. And so he did, and and he would just cover all types of historic moments, all types of you know he would he would uh, join the Foreign Legion and mm -hmm. write about it. He you know he would go undercover. You know, I'm on Devil's Island as a prisoner, and then he would write about it. And so those things, to me, very much hold up today, and and were 
amazing to read about now. That is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, you know, w one of the things uh, that, that we talked about uh, earlier in this interview was the fact that he was always raising money for his next adventure. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that amused me was um, seeing a Chase and Sanborn coffee ad with him uh, sharing the pages with uh, with Gary Cooper, a right. young Gary Cooper at that point. Sure. I mean, uh, did he have? A, I mean, did he do commercials on a regular basis? Yeah, he was one of the very first. Um, you know, when when you look through the archives and you look through, you know, his dad Wesley kept meticulous scrapbooks of his career, mm -hmm. and and you know he left everything to Rhodes College, and so um, Bill Short, who's the archivist there, was very helpful to me in writing the book, and, and he's mm -hmm. helped a lot of other um, Halliburton writers, and um, yeah, the the they're full of uh, promotional. Um, things mm -hmm. like, you know, oil, you know, brochures, and so <laughs> but he was one of the very first celebrities who, you know, did celebrity endorsements, and, wow. you know, a lot of this stuff was was the very beginning of this whole type of fame, uh -huh. and this whole type, you know, in the 20s, you know, it was very much like it is now, you know, we're under such a, a fast change in media, you know, and the way that, you know, the way that you make money from media and news is changing, everything's changing. Sure. And so it was very much like that. And you can see Richard, he was one, one step ahead, you know, uh, uh, all the time. So his career was really built on that wave, you know, of the 20s and, and 30s. When you talk about career direction mm -hmm. th th that, it, that he took, or the career directions that he took, um, there was also a point uh, where he was referred to as the boy adventurer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, which is something at the beginning of his career, he he more or less said, "I'll take that." Oh yeah, no, I mean he he came up with it. You know? Oh yeah, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. he put it out there. Yeah. yeah. And and really, you know, said, you know, I'm the boy adventurer. Mm -hmm. You know, travel and adventure is for the youth, is for the young, and you uh -huh. know, and so he was all about. You know, he would kind of look down on his um, friends at Princeton. Mm -hmm. You know, because here these guys were all studying and they were. You know, he felt pity for them because they were going to be a lawyer and a doctor right. and a, you know, uh, owner of a rubber manufacturer, you know, Goodyear tires. And, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, he felt sorry for them because they weren't taking advantage of his of their youth, uh -huh. you know. And, and interestingly, um, in the research, you know, he, he first of all, he donated, he dedicated his first book to his, you know, like four college roommates you know, the guys that were going to be the doctor and the lawyer. And, and eventually, you know, I was very, very curious what happened to those guys. And so mm -hmm. I looked it up and every one of them did exactly what he said they were going to do. And all of them lived into their, into their 80s, you know. So, uh -huh. you know, it was very, very interesting, yeah. you know, to compare, compare that. But, yeah, no, he, he, he started that. Um, and then, you know. But, but, but he got a little tired of correct, it. Correct, yeah, yeah. As he, you know, that, that worked you know, in his 20s. But he didn't give him the credibility that, he, that after a while he, he sought. Right, it made know. him marketable, and, yeah. it, and it made him make a lot of money, uh -huh. but, it, but it didn't necessarily give him the legitimacy or the respect that he so, you know, began to crave. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the little side items here is the fact that he, he swam the Panama Canal mm -hmm. Yeah, which is not a side item, but he holds the Guinness Book of World Records right. for paying the smallest toll ever to go through the Panama Yeah, Canal. that's right. Yeah, now, and, and he writes it in the book yeah. as though it were something that just kind of accidentally came about. You know, uh -huh. they said, we're not going to let you through here. You know, and he said, well, I have this letter that says I can go through. And they said, well, if you do, we're going to charge you a toll. You know, and then he said, I'll pay it. You know, it's got to be by weight. You know, here's how, you know, he called himself the USS Halliburton. You know, here's, here's my weight, you know. And so they charged him, you know, the cents that it, you know, that, it, you know, it, it um, added up to, you know. But, but in reality, from other things, I think it was you know, a joint publicity stunt between he and the people who r ran the uh, Panama Canal, you know, because, of course, there were reporters all around yeah, and, you yeah. know, and, and it was, um, but it was a very entertaining and fun you know, exercise, but he did ac absolutely swim, you know, through the Panama Canal, and they would, you know, the way they, you know, do the giant ships, sure. he would go into the lock, and they would close it down, and they would raise the water, and he would swim further, and uh -huh. he did it, the whole thing, just like he were a he ship. The whole thing, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, there is the Halliburton that the public got a chance to see, but mm -hmm. in the book, you also go through his letters. Mm -hmm. 
And in many ways, that's a very different uh, Halliburton that we that we see. This is a very sensitive mm -hmm. man. What was your sense of the man through his letters? Yeah, I mean, you know, a, a lot of people have written about Richard Halliburton and the adventures that he did. I, I didn't include a lot of the, you know, he went here and he did this. Mm -hmm. I really focused more on the relationships yeah. between he and his mother, his father, and Mary Hutchison. You know, Mary Hutchison, from, you know, who eventually, you know, is the namesake for Hutchison School. She actually started it. Uh -huh. um, she was best friends with uh, Miss Halliburton. Um, they had met in Brownsville when they taught school together. And so when the Halliburtons moved to Memphis, they, they uh, had uh, Mary Hutchison come with them to mm -hmm. help teach their children and a lot of the other children. So um, because there was no, uh, there were no grandparents, Mary Hutchison became the official grandmother um, of the Halliburton boys, and they called her Ammutter was her nickname, and mm. Mr. and Ms. Halliburton called her Hutchie. And so she was, you know, a, a big um, part of the family as well. Um, and so, you know, he wrote letters to her often. He wrote letters to his parents often. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the relationship between the three of them and Richard is really kind of the love story, you know, yeah. of the book. You know, they, they stayed very, very, very close. Um, he, they... He could, it, well, it seemed as if, you know, you get a sense in, in some of the letters that it was a trade-off. I mean, all this fame that he was getting, mm -hmm. but there was still an unfulfilled part of his life. He felt he f felt lonely, and he mentioned that several times. Yeah, I mean, yeah. He, he was very he, he was very lonely. Um, he was a little bit of a misfit. Um, he mm -hmm. didn't um, connect, you know, personally with a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. um, he was very focused on his. Um, on his work and on what he was doing, you know, mm -hmm. and then, you know, what they really wanted him to do was settle down in Memphis, you know, after one of his travels, he came home and, and there's even a uh, listing in his father's, in, in the phone book, in mm -hmm. the Memphis phone book with his father's name underneath it, you know, he put Richard's name as well, hoping that, you know, perhaps that would be the motivation for him to, you know, stay in town and uh -huh. settle down and find some Memphis cotton socialite, you mm -hmm. know, to get married to and have a lot of little Halliburtons. But, yeah. you know, it was not in the cards and he knew that. Mm -hmm. And so he didn't, um, he, he didn't um, want to hurt them. He didn't want right, to right. disappoint them, mm -hmm. you know, but he, and he had a hard time pushing away. Eventually, though, he did before his death. He, he managed to push away and build a house out in um, Laguna Beach, California. You know, mm -hmm. they were not happy about that. And Yeah, the know, Hangover House. The Hangover House, that's right. right. Yeah. yeah, that was quite a piece of architecture, and it wasn't, it wasn't an easy thing to, to, to build because of the height and how they had to get the construction material. It was just a wonderful description in your book about that. Yeah, it, it actually hung over a cliff, mm -hmm. you know, is why they called it the Hangover House. You know, and uh, 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 Bill Alexander, you know, a well-respected art, young, young architect uh -huh. um, and um, Halliburton's partner. You know, and the three of them worked on building this house. Um, but both his lifestyle at that time and the things he was doing and, you know, where he was spending his money, his parents were not happy about it. And mm -hmm. he also, they had edited his books. You know, he called them our books. They had mm -hmm. helped him research, yeah. you know. And so, you know, they were having a hard time, you know, letting him go. He was their only son. Right. You know, so, um, you know, but eventually he did, you know, he, he pushed away and, and he was on his own. And then, you know, towards the end of his life, you know, the letters between them were, were very touching. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You know, at one point in the book you say, you begin a chapter by saying, not everything that Halliburton touched turned to gold. And that mm -hmm. is where you talk about the only movie that he did. That's right. And uh, I, what was it, The Sins of India or something like that? Yeah, uh, yeah, he, he, um, he did... Um, um, India Speaks was the name of, India of, Speaks, of, of the movie. India Speaks, that's right, yeah. And, and really it was uh, pieces of scrap India footage uh -huh. um, that the producer sort of pieced together with Richard, and he was very excited to embark on this um, on this aspect of his career because you know he was really in love with Hollywood, he was in love with fame, and you know, he hung out with Mary Pickford, and you know he was friends with oh, all the yeah. stars, and um, so you know so he was a big part of the Hollywood scene back in the right. day, and he thought this was his big you know chance to try something different. Yeah. You know it, it was a huge failure. 
um, it, it was... Uh, and it was kind of fueled by a, a, a real cheese ball uh, uh, marketing campaign oh, yeah. for the movie. Yeah, the, the, it was just, and you know, this was in the beginning when everyone was experimenting and trying right. new things and film was new. Yeah. And, you know, like one of the lines from the campaign was, where gods look down unashamed on human orgies. Right, yeah, and of course, you know, I thought it was funny um, in reading his letters, and, uh -huh. and I'm sure that the failure probably hurt him more so than he yeah. let on, but, you know, it was like, next, you know, he exactly. just moved on. Yeah, he <laughs> you know, just, he just forgot about it. To the you next know? Yeah, he day. forgot about it and then moved on. Well, uh, let's talk about you for a second. We only have about a minute left in the sure. show. But uh, you are, uh, you have been involved in communications and marketing initiatives at the museum sure. in Washington, D.C., yeah. someplace that I have always wanted to go. Yeah, and anybody who comes to Washington, D.C. needs to come see us at the museum. It's a museum of history as seen through the eyes of the media. And mm -hmm. it's also a celebration of the First Amendment. So mm -hmm. it takes big artifacts like the Berlin Wall and then shows how the news and how, how journalism impacted, you know, the, the tearing down of the Berlin Wall. It's an amazing place. Yeah, and, and how, how is it laid out? Is it laid out through the different mediums of, of history, uh, print, and then eventually newsreels and things like that? Is that how... No, it's it's and it's six floors um, of of exhibit space, and it's, and it's all different types of things. The top of the World Trade Center is mm -hmm. there. We have um, every single Pulitzer Prize winning photograph is there. Many of them wow. are on display. Others are, are um, you know on a touch screen that you can mm -hmm. check out. So it's just anybody who loves media and journalism and photography. You know, it's an amazing place. Well, great. Uh, our Scott Williams, uh, the uh, half hour has just flown by. Thank you for being with us. Yeah, thank you very much for having me.